So Job chapter 7, and we uh, started last week in Job 6 hearing the first of Job's responses. Remember that uh, the book is sort of uh, orchestrated or arranged that, that in chapters 1 and 2 we have uh, the words of uh, God dealing with Job and God bringing these difficulties to Job through, through uh, the work of Satan, of the devil, uh, who is going to uh, carry this out and bring these frustrations and difficulties to Job's life. And then in Job 3, we had Job's uh, initial lament. He is uh, woeful over his circumstances. He doesn't curse God, but he does curse the day of his birth. In Job 4 and 5, we saw the words of Eliphaz, and it's the beginning of the speeches. And you'll remember that there are three rounds of speeches. And uh, in each of those, uh, in each of the first two, each friend will speak. And in uh, the final round, uh, two of the friends will speak. And, and then we'll go forward from there. But right now, we're in this first round of speeches. Eliphaz has spoken, and now Job is responding to him. In Job chapter 6, Job's... Uh, complaint in his responding to Eliphaz really centered on first the fact that Eliphaz has by his response diminished what Job is going through. That was Job's strong complaint that Eliphaz just doesn't get it. He doesn't realize the weight of what Job's going through that if he himself had gone through what Job was going through, he would have had the same sort of response, the same sort of woeful uh, lament. And then we saw Job turn on Eliphaz a little bit and say, uh, listen, not only do you not understand the depth of what I'm going through, uh, but you have been harsh in your dealings with me, and I find that you're really not able to reprove me. You, you are not in a position to do that because you think that all of this goes back to my sin, and it doesn't go back to my sin. Job continues to contend that his sin is not involved here. And we ended in Job chapter 6 hearing Job say, listen, I, I would be glad to listen. I want you to evaluate me. I want you to correct me if you can show the cause. But right now, I contend I'm still able to evaluate myself and I don't find myself lacking when it comes to my spirituality, when it comes to my righteousness. Job says I can still discern uh, the reason for events, and right now, I don't, I don't see the reason here. As we come into chapter 7, we're going to break this into two big parts. So the first six verses are Job's lament over his situation. From verses 7 to 21, we're going to hear him call out to the Lord. In verses 7 to 21, as Job calls out to the Lord, we'll break that down, verses 7 to 10, verses 11 to 16, and then verses 17 to 21. And we're going to hear Job basically say three things, and I'm going to go ahead and tell them to you. In verses 7 to 10, we're going to hear Job say this. He's, he's addressing God. You seem to have forgotten how frail I am. Remember me. So verses 7 to 10, he's going to say, remember me. Then in verses 11 to 16, we'll hear Job say to God, you torment and terrify me. Leave me. Leave me. And then in verses 17 to 21, we will hear Job say, you care about me, you punish me, pardon me, pardon me. As we go through this, it will make a little more sense. Why does Job go through this particular series of emotions? But we want to come down as we apply this to our life, and I want to talk to you tonight. First, we're going to talk about some steps to take when the night is long. So I'm going to talk about three steps to take when the night is long. And then I want to come down and I want to ask the question that Job asks in the end of this chapter. So if I sinned, why does it matter to you? And I want us to talk about four reasons that our sin matters. So Job chapter 7, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 21. Job says, has not man a hard service on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired hand, like a slave who longs for the shadow, and like a hired hand who looks for his wages? So I am allotted months of emptiness, and nights of misery are apportioned to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long, and I am full of tossing till the dawn. 
My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out afresh. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns, returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me? When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions? So that I would choose strangling and death rather than my bones. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. What is man that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? Visit him every morning and test him every moment? How long will you not look away from me nor leave me alone till I swallow my spit? If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. Job is experiencing a dark night of the soul, isn't he? Things are tough. One of the things that this whole book is teaching us is that it is a very human thing to experience emotional turmoil. We don't have a lot of room for that in our world. Um, if Job lived today, do you know what we would have done to Job? We would have medicated him. If Job lived today, we would have sent him to a therapist. If Job lived today, we would have relegated his experiences to that of some mad person, and we would have said that he needed perhaps to be institutionalized. Thank goodness that Job didn't live in our day and that we get to hear his heart, that we get to hear the breadth of his emotions, that we realize that just because he's experiencing a dark night of the soul doesn't mean that he needs to be cast off, doesn't, need that he, doesn't mean that he should be relegated to the back of the room, it doesn't mean that he should be shut up in a corner somewhere. In fact, it really means that we should hear him. Because there are Job's all around us. There are people who suffer like this, who are our friends and our neighbors, even our family members. And all they really long for is to be heard by God and to be heard by their fellow man often. Job begins in Job chapter 7 by talking about what his life has become. One of the things that you've probably taken note of by now is that uh, though Job had an incredible life prior to uh, these providential painful events, he has forgotten all about it. All of, the, all of the houses and the land, all of the, the livestock, the wonderful blessing of, of sons and daughters, if they're there at all, they are a shadow of what was. And Job has come to a place where he defines his life, not, not in terms of good and bad, highs and lows, blessings and cursings. No, Job defines his life as a complete curse. I'm not saying that's right. It's not healthy. It's, it's not balanced. But it is real for Job. One of the things we've talked about before is that when we get in a situation like that, we need people who can come alongside us and speak truth to us. And Job has his friends who do that, albeit in wrong ways sometimes. But here we see once again how Job is summing up his life. He says in verse 1, Has not a man a hard service on earth, and are not his days like the days of a hired hand? 
like a slave who longs for the shadow and like a hired hand who longs for his wages. So I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are apportioned to me. Job here is reducing the human experience to, to work, right? Job sees his life and he sees the life of, uh, of mankind in general as, as a hard day's labor, as, as difficult work. And Job is saying, uh, listen, this, this is what life is all about. It's about drudgery. It's about the mundane. It's about the hard work. It's about all the effort that I put in. I get up early in the morning and I work all day long by the sweat of my brow. And all I really want to do at the end of the day is get what belongs to me. I want the money that should be mine. I want the wages that I deserve. I just want to get what is coming to me. But Job says, I can't get what's coming to me. He says, I have this experience. This is verse 2. He says, I have this experience. I'm like a a slave who longs for the shadow. Anybody want to take a guess what he means there? It's the end of the day. He's longing for the sun to pass over him. He's longing for quitting time. We've all had long days, haven't we? We've had long days in the office or long days in the field or long days in our labor when we just seemed to want the day to come to its end. We want 5 o'clock to hit or whatever time our shift ends to come so that we can just go home and forget this day ever existed. Pastors have those too sometimes. Job says, I'm like that. I want my day to come to an end. I want this experience to stop. I want the shadow to pass over me, but it doesn't come. He, he says, I'm like a hired hand. Uh, he's talking here about a day laborer, right? Some, somebody who works for, for cash money on that day, starts early in the morning, works all day, and at the end of the day, they go to the overseer and they get what belongs to them. And Job is saying, that's sort of where I am. I'm at that place that I'm longing for my payment. I'm at that place that I've experienced all this hardship, all this difficulty, all this turmoil. I just want the blessing that is supposedly going to come from all of this. But what I'm given is emptiness. Job says in verse 3, I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are apportioned to me. He tells us about that in verse 4, doesn't he? He says, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long and I am full of tossing till the dawn. Job, I think, is speaking in two ways. Or there are two ways of reading this. The the first is literal. I, I do think that he's talking about his physical turmoil. That's the most plain reading of this, that that Job is saying, I I have these long nights because of my physical suffering, which he talks about in the next verse, because of his physical suffering, because of the spiritual anguish that he's going through, he can't get any rest. He comes to the end of the day, he's empty, he feels alone, he feels abandoned, he's still perplexed by all of the trouble that has come his way, and all he longs for is just to push through the actual night because he can't get any rest, he's sleepless, he's restless. He cannot lay down because of his sores, he can't get into a comfortable position. Maybe you've had those kind of experiences, maybe uh, after a surgery, or, or maybe you've had some injury that, that hasn't worked itself out, or, or maybe just after a long day when your mind is racing and your body is so tired that you just can't rest, and you lay there and lay there and lay there and think, my goodness, when, when will five o'clock come so that I can get up and put the coffee on and just get on with life? That's where Job is physically. He, he really can't rest, but I think more than this, he's, he's talking about a night of the soul that won't end. This experience of going through turmoil and agony and pain and hardship, it won't end. All I want is for morning to come. All I want is for the sun to rise. All I want is to lay down in peace, but I can't. I toss till the dawn because the night is long. He reminds us in verse 5 of his physical turmoil. It it would be easy for us to forget, wouldn't it? 
So one of the things we talked about in chapter 2 when we, when we heard about Job's suffering physically, that, that he was covered from head to toe in boils and that he was only able to take the broken pottery and scrape them in order to get some sort of relief. One of the things we did is we made note of, of all the places in this book where, where we're told about Job's physical suffering. It really is a, a thread that's woven all throughout this book. And that's good because what we need to remember is that Job is still in the midst of his suffering. He's not talking about something that happened to him. He is talking about something that is happening to him. This is ongoing. This turmoil remains with him. So in verse 5 he says, My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens then breaks out afresh. Can you imagine? Remember that, that Job's friends, when they came up in Job chapter 2 to see him, that they didn't recognize him. He didn't look like the Job that they knew. And that is due at least in part to the marring of his body by all of these sores. Can you imagine how he must have felt? We all know the experience of, of being uh, a teenager and going through all sorts of biological changes and some little blemish pops out. And we are bothered by that. If more than one pops out, we're really bothered by that. And, and maybe we've gone through those experiences of I, I don't want to be seen because of this. Can you imagine what it must have been like to have your whole body covered? Job, Job says, it's like my clothing. It's like my shirt and my, and my pants. It's, 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 a, it's a body covering for me. It's like a cloak. I'm covered in these things. He says, I've got worms and dirt all over me. Well, that's partly because he's sitting in the dirt, but it's also because his body is gross at this point. He says, I have these sores that they, they cake over, they get hard, but then because there's no real healing, they break open again, and we just start this over and over and over. Can you imagine what he must be feeling, not just physical, the physical pain and turmoil, but it's also the, the social, you want to talk about social distancing? Can you imagine the distance that Job feels from his fellow man? You and I live in a, in a day and age when, when we struggle through it, but, but we don't really relegate people who are disformed from society. If we do, we're looked down upon. That's not, really, that's not kosher anymore. But I hope you recognize that really until the last century, there were laws that prohibited people who were disfigured from being in public places. There were ugliness laws on the books that kept people at a distance in order to keep society somewhat clean and pure. Can you imagine what Job must have felt? He looks so dis disformed. He doesn't feel welcomed anywhere. He can't get any relief from his pain. And then he says this. He, he sums all of his life up in verse 6. He says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Now, maybe you're like me, and you, you, you weave or shuttle, what is that? I, I had a vague idea, but I wasn't exactly sure, so I went and looked it up. And a weaver shuttle is the, the piece of wood that the thread goes around, the yarn goes around, and it's what you use to weave a colored thread through other lines of thread, through other lines of yarn, and you are able to do it quickly rather than just having to do it by hand and go line by line. You can sort of push that shuttle through and you push it through from right to left and then you bring it back through from left to right and so forth and so on. And then you push the thread through and tighten up the weave. But of course, a shuttle can only hold so much thread. And Job says, my life is like the thread, the yarn on a weaver's shuttle. And it is passing quickly, and it's almost gone. Because of this, Job is convinced, and we'll see this in his address to God, Job is convinced there aren't any good days for me anymore. 
Everything I'm experiencing right now is tribulation and pain. And that's all I'm going to experience until my dying day. He says in verse 6, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. And what? They come to their end without hope. For Job, he doesn't look on his life and think there's going to be a day when this turns around. He doesn't look on his life and think there's got to be a point of return where I can be reconciled, where I can experience restoration, where God's grace will be poured out on me, where I will come back into his presence and know his favor when I'll experience the flourishing that mankind can know in God. No, Job says, I'm going to die without hope. I'm going to die without the promise of a blessed and favored life. I'm going to die without there being a change to my condition. Job is saying, I am going to die in pain. I am going to die in shame. And I'm going to die alone. No wonder he addresses God the way he does. His words are strong. We'll talk about that. They're not right in places. We'll talk about that. But for a moment, just consider Job. And I want you, as you consider that, I want you to think first about the people in your life who are like this. Who, who are the people you know who are miserable? Maybe through their own doing, or maybe not. But who are the people you know who live without hope? Who are the people that you know whose pain is so great that they don't think it'll ever be turned around? Who are the people in your life whose lives are coming to an end so quickly and they don't think there's any hope of turning? I want you to think about them and I want you to pray about how you can reach them because those are the people who need you. Those are the people who need you to bring the gospel to them. Those are the people that you need to bring a, a ministry of reconciliation to. Those are the people who you need to look at even when they may not be pleasant to look at so that they know that they are still people created in the image of a holy God. So those are the people you need to sit with so that they are reminded that God doesn't leave or forsake or abandon. And those are the people you ought to pray for because they're at the point where they find it difficult to pray for themselves. I want us to think about what would happen if we came to a long night of the soul. And I want you to think about three steps to take when the night is long. Remember Job said in verse number 4, When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise? But the night is long. What do you do when the night is long in your life? Well, these are three things, and they're so simple, but I think effective. They all center on the Word. Number one, you ought to read the Word. When the night is long, you ought to read the Word. I have a, a dear friend. Her name is Miss Edna. Miss Edna is about 88 now, and uh, she is a precious, precious woman of God. I would go and visit her pretty often, and we'd talk about all kinds of things. She'd bring me critiques of my sermons and Help me work through things. We talk about people that needed to be prayed for. We always ended our visits together praying. And often Miss Edna would tell me, she said, Brother Nick, I, I, just, I just sometimes can't sleep. I'm up at 1 or 2 in the morning and, and I just can't get to sleep. I'm sitting here all by myself. And she'd say, so I pray. I turn to the Word and I begin to seek what does the Lord say in His Word. I, I begin to think about passages that I don't quite understand and I, I go back to the Scriptures and I read them over again. I remember what was preached on Sunday and I read those passages again, but I, I read the Word and it fills those long, lonely nights. Brothers and sisters, when you are in a long night, you ought to read the Word you ought to read the Word because it's the only weapon you have in your spiritual war. Remember that often the reasons that we are perplexed and the reasons that we are bothered in our spirits is because there is warfare going on. There's a reason that we can't sleep sometimes. Sometimes it's because God wants our attention. Sometimes it's because the enemy is playing havoc 
with our souls. But in those long nights, if we would read the Word, we would find ourselves empowered for warfare. When we read the Word, it brings correction. There's something about those long nights when you can't sleep that things seem to come into focus when they don't any other time. You have time to think. There's no one disturbing you or distracting you. There's really not anything on television to watch. You, you have the time to turn to the Word and say, God, what is it that you want to teach me? And all of a sudden, where, where you may have not been able to hear before what it is that God wanted to say to you, He begins to show you where there's a sticking place in your life, a blind spot to the truth of the Word, and you begin to do business with God because He corrects you by His Word. The Word will bring instruction. There are long nights of the soul. There are long nights when we wonder, what is it, God, that I'm supposed to do? How is it, God, that I'm supposed to go forward? There's this circumstance that I have no direction on. Lord, would you teach me? And when you go to the Word and you begin to seek the will of God, God meets you there in His Word, and He can bring clarity to a circumstance that's been so muddy for so long. I think back to some of the moments in my life when, when I've had these long nights and haven't been able to sleep. Things that have worried me or bothered me. People I care about that I, I just don't know what to say. And I can point back to some specific occasions where God met me in His Word and brought me instruction that I didn't, ha- didn't have before. He taught me how to go forward. When you read the Word, He'll bring encouragement. Sometimes the reason that we have these long nights is because we hear all of the voices of the world. We hear all the things that people have said to us. We come to the end of a long day and we we try to lay down and rest, but there's no rest to be had. And it's because there are all those words going through our minds that we've heard from other people and we wonder, what did they mean by that? Or why were they so angry or harsh in that circumstance? Or or, or why why are they troubled over this particular thing? And we begin to to say, second guess ourselves we wonder what did I do to cause such offense how how did I create such a terrible situation why did I deserve that but when we read the word God will encourage us all of those other things begin to diminish and fall away and the riches of God's grace toward us come into view and we remember that we are loved we remember that we are cherished by him we remember that he doesn't leave or forsake we remember that we have access to him by faith in his son all of a sudden we're encouraged we can take heart our spirits are settled where they were at war when the night is long you ought to read the word Number two, when the night is long, you ought to pray the Word. I I am a major proponent, I hope you know this, I'm a major proponent of praying the Scriptures. It's what we do every Wednesday night at the start of our prayer service. I I tell you this, I I won't use any names, but but about ten years ago I was in a place where where I just couldn't pray at all. Every time I tried to pray, I, I couldn't get any words out. It just seemed so, so rote, so routine. There was just nothing fresh about my prayer life. Now, that had everything to do with me and nothing to do with God, but it was hard. Hard to be a pastor, hard to be a seminarian and not be able to pray. And I went to one of my professors and I said, I'm having this problem. I just can't seem to pray. What's wrong with me? And they said, well, pray the Word. And they said, pray the Psalms. The Psalms are a great thing to to pray. Well, they didn't really teach me anything about that. They just said, pray the Psalms. And because of the way that my brain works, I said, okay. And I took it as a challenge. I went home, I went to Psalm 1, and I wrote a prayer from Psalm 1. I went to Psalm 2, and I wrote a prayer from Psalm 2. I went to Psalm 3, and so forth and so on. And you know, not very long into that particular process, I was more discouraged than I was when I started. And then I had a change in 2013. Dr. Donald Whitney, great Southern Baptist theologian, uh, changed my life when he stepped into spiritual disciplines class one day, and he said, today we're going to talk about praying Scripture. And he'd been doing it all semester long, But then that day he walked in and he taught us how to pray the word. And essentially he did what we do every Wednesday night. He would pick the psalm. He would read it. He would focus in on 
some particular thought. He would go to the Lord in prayer and he would call that thought to mind and whatever flowed out of that was his prayer. And Donna Whitney taught me that when we pray the word, we don't say the same old things about the same old things. And that's what most of us do. That's why most of us don't like to pray. That's why most of us can't pray for more than two or three minutes. It's because all we ever do is say the same old things about the same old things. But when we get to the Word, all of a sudden there is life because what we have in the Scriptures are God's Word to us. And so we take the Word and we pray it back to Him. We go to something like Psalm 23 and we start and it says the Lord is my shepherd. And so we call out to the Lord and we say, Lord, you are our shepherd. You have shepherded us through difficult situations in our lives in the past. I, I think back to, to this particular circumstance and I remember how you guided me through that. And God, as I know you're my shepherd, I know you will continue to shepherd me. You'll bring me through difficulty. You're going to bring me through this present difficulty. It's your promise. You are guiding me. You don't leave me. You shepherd me and so forth changes your prayer life why should you pray the word in those long nights because usually in those long nights one of two things is going on either God has troubled you to get you up and get your attention and he wants to hear from you and he wants to speak to you or because there is some spiritual war going on in your life and you need to turn to the one resource you have, and that's the Lord. But often in those circumstances, you won't have the words to pray. You'll find it difficult. The body and the soul may both be so weary that you don't know how to cry out to the Lord. But if you'll turn to His Word and not only read it, but pray it, it'll transform your prayer life. And it'll deepen your walk with Him. When the night is long, you ought to read the word, you ought to pray the word. And the last thing you can probably guess, you ought to sing the word. One of the greatest messages I ever preached was from the book of Acts called Praying and Praising in the Pressure of Prison. I think back on that sermon often. And I'm reminded of Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail in the middle of the night praying and singing to the Lord. In the long nights of the soul or in the long nights physically when you just don't know when morning will come, sing the word. I, I cannot get over what it was like this morning to listen to this congregation sing. And I, I mean, I have not heard us sing like that in a long time. There was something that the Lord was doing in our midst today. There was a spirit of freedom that we don't often experience around here, or at least I haven't often experienced around here. How good it was to sit back and listen to the people of God freely worship. My dear friend, when you experience a long night, don't forget to sing. Don't forget to praise Him. Don't forget to cry out to Him in worship. And don't just praise Him with the, the cute little songs you've heard on the radio. Go to the, go to the truth of the Word. Praise Him with the songs of Scripture. Praise Him with the things that He says about Himself. Just a few months ago, I had a long night. I was troubled by something. Didn't exactly know what to do. Wasn't exactly sure how to pray. Wasn't sure what I wanted out of the circumstance or even what God wanted out of the circumstance. And so I sat down on the couch in our living room and I just began to sing. And all of a sudden, the things that God brought back to my mind, they, they weren't all the little songs I learned as a child in Sunday school. They, they weren't the popular songs on the radio. So they weren't even really the hymns that I've sung my whole life. They were the scripture songs that I learned in choir. And I began to sing things uh, like from Romans chapter 8 and sing, Who shall separate me from the love of God? Shall dreams of tomorrow fear or sorrow? You know, in all these things, in all these things, I'm a conqueror. In all these things, nothing will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus my Lord. 
I began to sing from Psalm 8 about what is man that you are mindful of him. You've made him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. All these songs began to come forth and it, it gave me a sense of peace that I had not known in several days. When you come to a long night, sing the word, praise him, and you'll find that all of a sudden, morning will come. Well, look at verse 7. Here we have Job turning. He's talked about his condition. He's reflected. He's lamented. He's woeful about his circumstance. And now we see Job turning in verse 7. He says to the Lord, Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house nor does his place know him anymore. The first thing we hear Job saying to God is remember me. Job here in so many words is saying, Lord, you are piling it on. You are pouring out the pain. You are bringing me through the trouble. And I just can't take it anymore. Lord, would you remember me? Remember how frail I am? Remember that I am but dust? Remember, as it says in Psalm 103, that I, I have a, a very simple frame? Remember how fragile it is? Job is asking God to remember him. Not, not to remember him in terms of his works, not to remember him in, in terms of his, his past living. No, Job is saying, would you just remember me, the, the physical person, the real Job, the person who is being pushed to the brink? Because I just can't carry on very long. Job says to the Lord, God, I, I'm like the cloud that fades and vanishes as soon as the heat comes on. My life is like a breath. Job says, not only am, am I never going to see anything good again, that shows you his outlook. When he says in verse number 7, I, my eye will never see good again, he's saying, I, I don't have any hope anymore. But he also says that the one who looks on me, that's God, the one who looks on me is going to look at me, but he won't see me much longer. Job says, I am at the breaking point. I'm at the point of no return. I can't live like this much longer. I'm going to die soon. God, would you just remember how frail I am? In verse 11, Job says, God, would you just leave me? Look at verse 11. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. Job says, listen, I, I am past the point. I can't carry on like this. There's not much more I can take. I can't be silent about this thing. I, I don't have any other option but to say how I feel, to say what I need. He says, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in anguish of my spirit. In other words, I, I'm not going to God with these, with these simple pleasantries. I, I'm not going to go to God with the, the rote forms. I, I'm not going to go to God and, and fake it in prayer. No, I'm going to God just like I am. My life is falling apart. My soul is tormented. I don't need to fake it. I need Him to see me for who I am. I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Job says, am I the sea or a sea monster that you set a guard over me? Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, the message, says, God, are you trying to muzzle me? Clearly, Job feels some pressure that perhaps he shouldn't say these things. He feels that pressure from his friend Eliphaz. He feels that pressure perhaps in his relationship with God. But Job says, I don't have any other choice. I've got to get it out. He says in verse 13, When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then... You scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that I would choose strangling and death 
rather than my bones. Job says, all I want to do is lay down at night and be at peace. All I want is one night's rest. All I want is to be able to get through the difficulty for just a day. God, I, I understand I'm going to be tormented all day long. Couldn't I just have the night to rest? So I go and I lay down on my bed. I, I get on my sleeping couch. I, I'm there trying to get some rest. And what do I find? I close my eyes and a whole other world comes to life, doesn't it? There's a torment of the mind. There's, there are nightmares that come to him. There's a raging in his soul. He can't get still. He can't be at peace. He's so bothered by this, he says, I, I wish I'd strangle in my sheets then get up the next day and keep living like this. Look at what he says in verse 16. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. Job has taken assessment of his whole life. He's come to the conclusion there's no cause for hope. He's so perplexed he doesn't have an option, he thinks, but to cry out to the Lord. And when he does, he cries out of the bitterness of his soul. And he says to God, I can't find any rest. I can't find any peace. There's no moment in my life that's at all pleasant. I would rather die than live. Why don't you just leave me alone and let me die? Brothers and sisters, you've encountered somebody who feels like this. You may not know it, but there are people who have this outlook on life. I had a conversation with someone last week who had this outlook on life. They have lost such hope. They're so bothered by their circumstances. They don't see any other way out. That's where Job is. Has God abandoned him? No, not for a moment. Does God have purpose in Job's pain? You better believe it. Are we going to see the glory of God come down in Job's life and bring restoration and reconciliation? We will. But for the moment, hear the heart of Job. God, I can't go on like this. Why don't you just leave me alone? He says, remember me. He says, leave me. And then in verses 17 to 21, he says, pardon me. He says in verse 17, what is man that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? Visit him every morning, test him every moment. How long will you not look away from me nor leave me alone till I swallow my spit? If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made me your mark? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. The thrust here for Job is sort of twofold. In the first, Job wants to know, why is God so concerned about me? He's made this whole world. There are all these other people he cares about. There's every other opportunity for him to set his, his work, his, his watch upon someone else. Why a watcher of man, Job says. Are you concerned about me? Why do you take note about my life? Why are you watching when I rise and when I fall? Why do you want to know all about my family? Why do you want to see all the pain that I experience? Why do you want to hear all the, all the excruciating cries that come forth from my soul? Why, oh God, why do you want to make me your mark? That's to say, Job says, God's put a bullseye on me. 
Now he's got his target set on me. He's using me for target practice, Job says. Why, God? Why do I have to be your target? And then Job shifts. Because clearly everybody around him thinks that all this is owed to sin. Job has contended that he hasn't sinned. That's not what's going on here. And in fact, he's right, though he doesn't know what's going on. And so Job says here, so what? So what if I sinned? If I did sin, perhaps in the event that I did sin, if that's what this was all about, why would it matter to you, Job is asking? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? If I sinned, why do you have to punish me so? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a question that we should take seriously because Job has talked here about his experience and he's contending that sin is not behind this. But here Job says, but even if it was, what would the big deal be? And we want to answer that question. Because sin is a big deal. So let me give you four reasons that our sin matters. Number one... Our sin creates a separation in our relationship to God. Why does our sin matter? Because our sin creates a separation in our relationship to Him. That is true for the whole world. We are all sinners. We've all fallen short of His glory. We all deserve the wage of our sin, which is death. We are separated from Him. The message of the gospel is that that separation is bridged by the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and through his empty tomb. But at the heart of it, when Job says, so what if I sin? What would that matter? What's the big deal? What did it do to you? Well, it separated God's people from him. That's what it did. Number two, why does our sin matter? Because our sin subverts the will and the wisdom of God. Why does our sin matter? Because our sin subverts the will and the wisdom of God. God created the whole world. God was in the beginning. He will be at the end. He is the eternal one. And He has no rival. Because He has no rival, His will is law. You don't get to argue with that. You, you don't get to question that. You, you don't get to make a proposal for a new bill in the kingdom of God. No, no, no. He sets the agenda. It is His will and His wisdom that are always in authority. When you and I sin, we are saying something about the will and wisdom of God. We're saying that God's wrong. It's an attack on His will. It's an attack on His wisdom. It is an affront to who He is when we sin. When we sin, we're saying we ought to be in charge and not God. That we could do better. That our ways, our thoughts, our motives, our agendas are higher and greater than His. That's what we're doing when we sin. Why does our sin matter? Number three, because it mars the image of God that we are called to bear in the world. One of the most elementary truths of Scripture is what we learn in Genesis chapter 1, that we are created in the image of God. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl created in the image of God. We bear that image even still, though we bear it in a fallen way. We do not perfectly reflect the image of God in the world. There's only one who does that, and who is it? It's the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the very image, the imprint of God in the flesh. When you and I sin, we mar the image of God that we are called to bear in the world. You know, it's one of the reasons that I am increasingly pushed away from the politics of our day on both sides because we constantly hear such vile rhetoric against individuals. There's no substantive discussion. We, we're not hearing policy discussion. No, we're hearing personal attack. Red and blue, Republican and Democrat, 
Everybody is out to get somebody else. And all I can think anymore, because God has impressed this on me more and more, that every time that we hurl insults at an individual, we are making an attack on somebody who is an image bearer. It's an attack on God Himself. And then that comes home to roost. Because I can't do anything about the insults that the president hurls on Twitter. But I can do something about the things that come out of my mouth. When I sin, I am marring the image of God in another person if I sin against them. And when I sin, I am marring the image of God that I am called to represent in the world. There's a stain on God's picture in me. Number four, why does our sin matter? It matters because it creates a separation from God. It subverts the will and wisdom of God. It mars the image of God we're called to bear in the world. Number four, our sin matters because it demands sacrifice both for God's satisfaction and for our salvation. Why does our sin matter? Because there's a cost. One of the things, if, if you've signed your grandkids or your kids up for Bible school, or if you haven't done that, I, I encourage you to do it if, if you have kids that would be Bible school aged. But one of the things we talked about in our Bible school this year is the need for sacrifice. And so the stories, they started in Genesis with a sacrifice for Adam and Eve, God killing an animal so that they could be clothed. Uh, and then the story went to that of the Passover, a sacrifice for a family so that they could be saved. And then the story went to that of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies and the Day of Atonement and a sacrifice for the nation of Israel one day a year. And then the story went to the cross, one perfect sacrifice for the world. It's a great lesson to teach children that from the very beginning their sins matter because their sins require sacrifice. And so do yours, and so do mine. We go through our lives and we flippantly talk about our sins sometimes. We think, well, it doesn't matter that much. It isn't that important. Maybe we find ourselves so overwhelmed by the circumstances of life that we begin to cry out to God and say, you know what, my life is so messed up. My life is so troubled. My life is so hard. I'm so overwhelmed by the pain and the suffering. Why, Why are you so concerned about my sin? And the God of heaven and earth says, I am concerned about your sin because it costs me my son. That's why it matters. Because it required the perfect sacrifice of the sinless Son of God. So that God's wrath would be satisfied. And so that we might experience salvation. Job's had a long night. And he doesn't think he can come to the end with any sense of hope. We'll see that change, but for the moment, I want us to end thinking about our own lives. Maybe we've been there, maybe we are there, or maybe we know someone who's there who says, I, I don't have any hope anymore. And I want us, as we close, to pray. To pray for those people who've come to that place in their life that they would look again at the gospel. And that they would recognize that no matter how dark things may get in this world, if their faith is in the Son of God, there's a cause for hope. And I want us to pray that as we see those people in our lives, that God would give us the grace to be His hands and feet to them and to remind them that they are not alone when the dark night of the soul comes to them. Father, as we think about these words from Job, hearing his response to his friend, we recognize the great turmoil he was in. And Lord, we realize that there are people around us who are experiencing these dark nights of the soul. Their lives have become so difficult, they're so troubled and pained and Sometimes that's because of their own doing and sometimes 
It's because like Job, you have providentially brought them to the experience of personal pain. Maybe we find ourselves there. Maybe we're the person. Nobody knows it. We've done a good job hiding it. But when we get home at night and we're all alone, we're just like Job. We wish that we could just lay down and be at rest, but there isn't even rest to be had there. Father, we lift those who experience these difficult moments to you. People in our circles, our friends, our family. We ask God that that you would help those who have lost a sense of hope to come back to the gospel. Not because the gospel will mean a complete change of their circumstances here and now. Not, Not because the gospel can bring any soothing to their physical suffering in this moment. But because for all times the gospel holds out hope for those whose faith is in your Son, Jesus Christ. And no matter how dark the night may be, no matter how long or intense, no matter how great the desire that we should just come to the end of our days because we do not have hope, if our faith is centered on Jesus Christ, that we have a cause for hope in this world for all eternity. Because one day this will come to its end and we will be brought, brought into the presence of God, in the kingdom of God never to experience these turmoils and troubles again. Father, if we know people in these circumstances, I pray you would help us not to look past them. I pray you would help us not to walk around them. I pray you would help us not to avoid them but instead to run to them, to pray for them, to instruct them when needed from the Word of God, and perhaps more than anything else, to be there as a reminder that God hasn't abandoned them and that He hears their prayers. Would you go with us from this place? Help us to walk in your peace, to shine your light, and to share your love with the people we encounter this week. We ask it in Jesus' name.